evening. Something great is about to happen. Amen. I said something great is about to happen. And I know that for a fact because we are in the presence of the, the Lord Almighty. Amen. Shalom, everybody, and good evening. And thank you, Adonai, for being a part of this evening, God. Thank you for strategically setting up this house of God for such a time as this, God, that we prepared already in our hearts, God, as we entered into this door. Your presence surely overwhelmed us, God. So, Father, we just ask that you have your way this evening, God. Touch our, our dear rabbi, God, and use him in a great and in a mighty way, God, as we sit at his feet this evening, God, to learn what you have to share to us this evening, God. Take us to the next level, God, as you desire to do that, God. So, Father, we commit this time to you, God. Bring those that's coming on the highway, God. Bring them all here safely, God. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that's here already, God. Just give you all the glory and honor. In Yeshua's mighty name, we pray and we all say amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Rabbi. Hallelujah, shalom. What a blessing to be here and in his presence in his house. God is good all the time. All uh, right. Well, we're, we continue to um, trust God as we all grow together in his word. Um, how important are these classes because the best thing that we got going is uh, growing in the Word of God. You know that scripture that says heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will not. Shows us how important His Word is. Above everything, it is His Word that keeps us on track, doing what He desires for us to do, and able to help us overcome many of the if not all the problems in this world as we seek him. And secondly, that he's empowered us by his spirit so that we may overcome and be more than conquerors and overcome all the power of the enemy. Uh, tonight, uh, I'll be sharing with you, most of you know um, about PARDIS, the four levels of learning. Um, and these four levels um, are also found in the New Covenant, not in the same way they're found uh, by uh, the Jewish teachings, but in fact, um, the first one, being Pisad, has to do with the simple interpretation or literal interpretation of the Word of God. Ramiz has to do about the Lord giving us through parables hints, and Darash, is, which is actually um, a more deeper and more difficult uh, learning process to be able to pass the rush to sword, which is when God releases the, the, the deep secrets of his heart. Even the Talmudians, the disciples, had a difficult time um, getting past number three. So when you're looking at the four levels of learning, it's not just about I got to get from this level to this level to this level and the final level because it's, it's a purposeful levels of learning that we have to pause and see what, what it is that we're doing, what we're learning, what we're hearing. Um, and then to be able to have the foundation to all of that, what leads us to the... Uh, four levels of learning to the parties. Uh, and that's what I'm going to get into now. And if we have the opportunity, we're, we're going to get down to uh, some other areas that will introduce us really to the parties in the correct way. Now, according to, uh, I would say, middle, middle to second century writer, the Justine Martyr, uh, he he was a writer at that particular time, and, and he wrote certain things to 
to, um, that is enlightening to us because the Jewish people followed a certain pattern when they went to the synagogue and how they uh, approached the, um, to convey the word of God. Uh, and the bima, this is the bima, here's the, the pulpit. And according to his writings, uh, uh, a person would come up and then he would read a scripture. And after he read the scripture, uh, he would explain what that scripture was. There was no really lect uh, uh, no lecturing uh, that took place, but he would read the scripture, explain the scripture, and then he would go sit down. You find that Yeshua would do the same thing. He would read the scripture, and then what he would say, explain it. This day, this is what has happened, you know. Uh, scripture is, is being fulfilled, and then he would go and sit down. So th this is more or less how the Parsha uh, took place because Yeshua is following the sequences of how he, was, how he grew up, his, his family being, uh, uh, you know, orthodox, uh, in orthodox Ju Judaism. He was brought in that way, and so he taught in the same way. And so th this is, I would say, really important so that we could understand that there is a process there's an already established foundation, and we need to get to the roots of our faith and the roots also of the approach to learning. Because if we do not get the approach to learning, we will just do paste and copy. What is paste and copy going to do? You know, if you don't have a true foundation enough under your belt so that you can speak out of conviction and speak uh, out of uh, true learned knowledge um, from obedience to the Lord that says to study it, to show ourselves approved of God. A servant that should not be ashamed but being able to rightly, correctly interpret, divide the word of truth. And so this is uh, really important that we have a foundation if we're going to rightly divide, interpret the word of the Lord so that others can learn from us. Now, the same, uh, uh, let's look in First Timothy because then it leads to being, becoming a, a true minister and a true leader. But in this scripture in First Timothy 3, 1, 6, it gives us... Um, I would say it gives us uh, an understanding of the requirements of those that are going to be teaching. Being uh, here in a, in a Torah class, and those of you that are, are learning through live stream, you're here not just to learn, but you're here to lead, to be uh, those that will lead others to Messiah, according to Matthew 28. But Yahweh says, uh, to go ye into all the world and, and teach. So this is a command not to just certain people, but I think it's for the whole body of Messiah that we are all to go out and, and teach about the gospel, teach the gospel about Yeshua the Messiah. And it says, here is a statement that you can trust. Anyone aspiring to be a congregational or a congregation leader is seeking a worthwhile work. Excellent seeking, good work for us to do. A congregation leader must be above what? Reproach. Mm -hmm. He must be faithful to his wife, temperate, self-control, orderly, hospitable, and able to teach. Now those points are, are extremely important. They must, they must be temperate, being able to hold their temper, being able not only to do that, but to have control over their, their, their thoughts and their words, being a person of order, orderly, hospitable, and then able to teach. That's why we need the instructions. And that's why we are here. And you must not uh, drink excessively or get into fights. Rather, he must be kind and gentle. Everyone that we bring up to, to read a scripture should be a person that's what? Kind and gentle. 
besides everything else that we just read. He must not be a lover of money. That shouldn't be a priority in his or her life. And he must manage his own household. How? Well. Say well. well. Yeah, having children who obey him with all proper respect. For if a man can't manage his own household, how will he be able to care for God's, well, it says in the original messianic community. And he must not be a new believer. Don't ever put a new believer in front, he's saying, because he might become puffed up with pride and thus fall under the same judgment as did the adversary. My, my. So I think that the word of God is saying something really hugely important. And that's why everyone that's going to come up here in front to lead, to read scripture, whatever, must have a solid foundation. Okay? So the Bible is very clear about this. Clearly, it is warning us that when you make someone who is not seasoned in God's word a congregational leader, there's danger because there's pride, because he's not seasoned, still immature. There's pride. Pride is going to creep in, and he's going to become prideful. And because of immaturity, they can very quickly or quick, they'll be quick to draw conclusions about what? About the members. See, they're immature. They're not seasoned. And, and, and because they're not seasoned, they look at the members, they're seeing what they're doing, what they're not doing, and they're drawing conclusions. Remember the one that was sick for 38 years? What did the Lord say? Don't draw two conclusions here. Because he's not sinning. It's, because, it's not because he sinned. Not because his parents sinned. It's because of God's glory that's going to happen. So let us not put someone that's not seasoned enough because they might just do this, the, the wrong th thoughts. And then we have issues in the body of the Lord. Quick to draw conclusions about other members of the body. So an immature person is quick to connect dots that even don't exist. It's in his imagination. And so we all must be careful, every one of us, that we are not quick to tie all sin to something bad or, or to calam calamity. That would be wrong. Now, there are some believers, um, like the one that Paul spoke about, by this time, they should be teachers, but they're not, they're not seasoned. They should actually be seasoned teachers, but they are immature. And one way that you know they are immature is that they are unable to receive correction. Do you know someone sometimes? They get real mad if they hear something. They get an email from someone or something, you know, and, and they get frustrated. They get mad at that person for sending that. That shows immaturity. That's, that also shows that the person should never be leading. It's, that person is not seasoned. It's already judging, right? Okay, so one way is, is that way. Their immaturity can cause them to fall into the condemnation also of the enemy. And what is the word of God says? That there is no, what? There is no condemnation to them that are in Messiah Yeshua. Meaning, in, if you are in God's word, and Yeshua is the Messiah, right? Yeshua is the word. And there is no condemnation that are of them that are in the word. Yeah. Not just saying, I'm saved, but are you in the word? Now, what is it that a person does best when they get angry? What, what is it that they do best usually? Well, when they get angry, what they do best is that they take it out on others. Let's say that someone got angry in the congregation and they says, I'm out of here. Why? 
because of one person? Now you're taking it out on the pastor or the rabbi. You're taking it out on everyone. That's what happens when a person is immature, is not seasoned. They may have been a believer for years, but they walk out with their family. Everyone walks out with their whole family because of one person that said something. You see, this important message is so important because you are to be the teachers of others. And you need to understand, we need to understand these basic principles. It's got to be part of our foundation so that we can be aware of what we're saying and that we never fall into the trap of condemnation by the devil. And then we say something that's going to hurt more than just the person that said something. First Timothy 3, 1 and 6. What does it say there? He must be faithful to his wife, temperate, self-control. This is part of, of what God is asking us to be so that temperate and self-control will always be there. And as ministers or leaders or those that, that are allowed to come up here, suddenly there, we lose our temper and we don't have self-control, we better just sit. We better say, I'm going through something right now. Please pray for me. So Isaiah 61, it shows us how God can use these circumstances that, that we may have fallen into to restore us properly. Let's say that there is someone that, you know, is causing and, and all of this issues and problems. The Spirit of the Lord uh, here says in Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. See, when we come and do teshuva and we repent and we turn around, then the Spirit of the Lord can return to us. Just like David, he had sinned against God. And the Spirit of God came back and anointed him. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance. You see how, how gracious God is? I mean, it caused all this trouble, but God is so loving and so forgiving. Yes, restitution, of course, has, has got to be made before God can allow his spirit to come back upon us. But look how, how awesome God is to provide those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of what? Ashes. You see, people that do this, it's like their lives are broken up. I should never have said that, you know. I really messed up. But God says, I can give you a garland instead of the ashes that you feel that you're in right now. I'll give you the oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. And they will be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord to display his glory. Wow. And they shall build up the ancient ruins. And they shall rise up the former devastations. And they shall repair the ruined cities. The devastation of many generations. So... Okay, we went from one step to another. We, we, we've, we've gone to the fact that uh, we started out, you know, how they did things in the early church. And then they gave a short explanation, and then they sat down. And then when they were ready in 1 Timothy 3.16, they began to learn about what is expected of them as a leader, as someone that comes up front with their family, with their friends, their neighbors, with the congregation. 
And now in Isaiah, the Lord comes to, to restore those that have fallen. He would have no one to perish. And now we're ready for Leviticus 21.10. This is where we learn respect for those in spiritual authority. You see, if they're not brought up properly, the foundation's not there, and, and they're not getting along with the other members, and they're not getting along with their neighbors, they're not getting along with family members, they've got serious issues, they're not ready yet for Leviticus 21.10. But now they should be ready, because it says the Kohen, the, 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 the priests, this is where we learn that there are those that God has called that everyone needs to respect because God has placed them as spiritual authority over us. He gives us now a description of the respect everyone should render to the priest as the one who is the greatest of them all. It's talking about the high priest here says, the Kohen, which is the high priest, is ranked highest. He's been elevated, in other words, among his brothers. The one on whose head the anointing oil is poured and who is consecrated to put on the garments. See, not everyone is consecrated to put on garments the role of a minister or a leader. That's what the garments represent. Is not to stop it. It says, let me read this part again. Who is consecrated to put on the garments. That is not to stop grooming his hair, nor tear his garments. So why does it talking about grooming his hair? Hmm. Well, you see, in the Word of God, the Bible, hair and the beard are actually discussed or talked about in connection with, with the prophets. Those that, that would bring the message, thus saith the Lord and other holy men of, of God. They were anointed on behalf of God to say, thus saith the Lord. Since uh, they represent also the Lord as he is expressed in his word. Their hair and their beards represent the, the, the literal, the simple or the literal where people could see it and understand it without any deep, um, maybe a teaching. It, they represent the literal, external teachings of God's word. So when the people saw the priests with their beards, it reminded them that they are the ones that are teaching them, starting from level one, the literal, the simple. Their hair and beards represented the literal, external teachings of the Bible, which is why they were forbidden to shave their head, their hair, to clip their hair. Now, when it says not to stop grooming, it also implies not to stop grooming um, spiritually. You know, it's this, it, there's an understanding saying, I've been grooming him or her for ministry for a long time. Do you, do you get the idea? So, so it, it, the Lord is saying not to stop grooming, not to stop grooming, it implies also, don't ever stop studying my word. I've called you to be a leader. Don't just get up and, and, and then that's all you ever do. Don't just get up and play the guitar and that's all you do. No, you, you, you came up here to minister. Therefore, you are leading people into the presence of God and so God now requires you to continue in his word. When I was a, a young evangelist, I, I would, you know, travel around and I would see um, groups that were invited, gospel groups, and they would sing, and after they sing, they'd go outside, out there in the front. 
Well, what are they doing out there? Why don't they sit down and be part of the sermon? Oh, well, gee, we just came to play. Okay, you know. That means that they're not in the Word. They don't have this, this hunger for God's Word. And everyone that comes up here, no matter what they're doing, we better be sure that they are in the Word constantly. And we have to help them and make the way so that they could be in the Word because they are representing the kingdom of our God and they must be fully anointed. What? Why? Because everything's going to pass away. The tongues, the music, it's, it's, it's everything, but his word shall remain. That's what the anointing is. That's what the Holy Spirit can take, the word that's in you. And the Holy Spirit will bring back to mind those things that are in you. If there's nothing in there because all you do is just this or that, what anointing is going to come through you so you can really touch people's lives? Mine. So Isaiah 61 shows us how awesome God is ready to bless you with a mantle of praise instead of a faint heart. If you've got the mantle of praise, I tell you something, it's, it's like uh, the Davidic worship. The, the praises is what brought the walls of Jericho down. They were not just singing and going around seven times around and the trumpets just trumpeting seven times around. No, it, it was because they had the mantle of praise. And why they had the mantle of praise? Because they were in God's Torah. Right? And this is a message that's for us today because this is exactly what is coming around. What goes around is now coming back around and God's bringing us right back to our roots to do it the right way. Why? Because we are creatures of what? Habits. And it's hard to change habits. And if it's hard to change habits, then it's going to be hard to go through a transition. And we won't be able to go through a transition because we were brought up a certain way. We were taught a certain way. Things were permitted. And so those things that were permitted have now become part of our habits and part of our ways. And then what are we going to do with God when he says, just before he comes, I'm going to do a brand new thing. Are you ready? Are you ready to shift? Are you ready to change? No. Why? Because you're a creature of habits and you won't change even if your pastor tells you to change. And if you, and if you won't change because your pastor, because of what your pastor, your, oh, Will you change if God says it? No, you won't do that also. Because God says, how can you say that you love him and you don't love a man? How can you tell God that you're going to change and you don't change when your pastor says, it's time to change? Someone say amen. amen. Okay, so now we find in honor of Leviticus 21.10 that God, God has put in his word that we must honor those in spiritual authority over us. The high priest, it says there that the high priest uh, literally ranks the highest among his brethren. That is true in the eyes of God. He put it there in his word. Why isn't it true with us? He represents, he is his voice here on earth. The pastor, the rabbi, whoever is really called is anointed of the Lord. The new covenant concept for those who teach is found in 1 Timothy 5.17. It speaks about the leaders or the elders who lead, who lead well should be considered worthy of double honor. You, you know, you say, I'm not getting my double honor and I've been leading. It's because you have not been leading well. Because it has nothing to do whether the church could afford to give you double honor or not. Your double honor and your promotion comes from the Lord. And that's how you're going to get it. You don't look for man to give you a double honor. 
but God is going to give you a double honor. Why? Because he puts it in his word that you are deserving of a double honor. Especially, it says, those working hard at communicating the word, at teaching. So it's important, folks, to note that today, and we know this to be a fact, almost anyone, even unprepared individuals, are given the pulpit to teach or to preach. But it was not so in the beginning. That's why the Lord says, uh, not all should be teachers. The office of preaching belonged to the bishops and the priests. And it was not given just to anyone or someone who could just read scriptures or maybe that person has such charisma that you want the people to hear his voice or her voice. No. Teaching was only for the qualified seasoned. You go to a dentist, do you want one that is unqualified, unseasoned? What is he going to do with your tooth? What about the injection? What about the size of the needle? <laughs> okay. So they were unseasoned. People were not brought up. And you already learned some reasons why this evening. To change does not seem to come natural. That's one of the things. At least to most people. It's not always easy to go through a transition, right? In life. Even moving and all of that stuff. Transitions are difficult, you know why? Because it involves a change in patterns. We establish patterns. We have established routines. We have established routines. And we are comfortable to keep even those patterns and routines for an entire lifetime. I've always done it this way. I've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. This is really hard, you know. If God brings in a new shepherd, a new pastor to pastor, and he feels led by the Spirit, and the members get up and says, wait a minute, hold it. What are you doing? We've never done things that way. We've always done it this way. But they're not ready for a new thing, right? Yeah. So it's, 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 it's really in the natural and not in the spirit. Routines mean that, that the same things happen, what? Generally, they happen the same way practically all the time. To change, that even for God's sake, we have to do a lot of thinking. To change, even for your pastor's sake, you got to do a lot of thinking. I need you over here to do some repair work. I really need for you to come and help us in this area. And what does the members do? I got to think about it. What do you have to think about it? <laughs> Well, what is it, the problem? It's patterns and routines. You know, this is why a lot of people are not in the house of the Lord. It's because th there's patterns and routines, and they are not aware that they, they are uh, addicted or they, they are just stuck in the mud of patterns and routines. And they don't even know that they're stuck there because the patterns and the routines have become a way of life. Very hard then. The patterns and routines and habits, then there's, when is there going to be a transition? Never. How could there be? If you're stuck in the patterns and the mud of routines, there will never be a transition, so there will never be a spiritual promotion. There will never be what God wants to offer us, a ministry of worship and praise that is second to none. So this leads to 
to being predictable and there seems to be some kind of safety, safety in predictability because we know what to expect. It's really our comfort zone, isn't it? Because we really want to know what to expect and that's out of the zone of knowing what to expect. And transition, even if it comes from heaven, then threatens that comfort zone. Have I, have I not told you? How many times did God say that to his people? So what makes transition so hard? Even if they are for the better, right? We know that that transition is for the better. And we're still making it hard. Even if we know we're going to get a promotion, we still make, find it that it's too hard. Even though we know that it's for a happier marriage, we still have a hard time in going and wanting to, to go through a transition. And because I believe that it has a lot to do in the fact that we wired ourselves in our natural mind to resist the change. We've already wired our mind. How in the world are you going to change if you wired yourself that way? So one key function of our brain is to regulate the body for survival, right? So if, if your body is threatened, like you're going to, you could die in this kind of situation, your brain immediately goes right to work and begins to regulate your body on, 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 on maybe breathing correctly so that you don't die that moment. I'll give you this short little testimony when I was, I think I was only uh, eight, eight or nine years old, I ventured into the water and I didn't know how to swim. This was like in Stockton, California. And I went too far and it was over my head. And I didn't know how to swim. And I became concerned that the waves in the water would push me further. So immediately, my brain went to work and showed me what I had to do. What was it that I had to do? First of all, stay calm. Then breathe easy. Don't breathe fast because you're gonna breathe water, right? You know, I'm only eight or nine years old, but my brain went right to work and it began to do what it needed to do. And then my brain said, put your hands straight up until you feel air and start walking towards the shore real slow, real slow. Don't walk fast because the waves will push you. Just real slow, you know, like a turtle, you know. And evidently, my brain was telling me, you can do this because the shore is not that far away. And I made it all the way, and I didn't tell my mom or my dad. <laughs> Okay, you, you, see, you see what happens here Ab about our brain here? Our brain seems to, to regulate and put us in a situation of the survival of the fetus. We have a tendency towards being interdependent on surrounding elements. The information collected from our five, uh, five primary senses actually helps us to detect danger and it allows then our brain to understand our environmental predicament or environmental uh, conditions, enabling us to react to our surroundings. And so we absorb information. How is it that we absorb it? Through sight, through hearing, through touch, through smell, and through taste, which is 
quickly relayed and interpreted to our brains. To, for what purpose? It is to provoke a reaction from our brain. So these five senses that God gave us, gave us is operating all there to keep us going and, and keep us alive. So it is, it, is, uh, it is something also because uh, those that work underground with mines and tunnels, they have sharpened their, their senses. Their senses play a vital role in keeping them safe. Why? Because they're deep under the ground, right? And their senses are telling them that this little small tremor that they're feeling, and they already know the, the level of it, how dangerous it might be, whether they should press that alarm button and get everybody out of there. You see, when we stop growing in God's word, our natural five senses... They kick in and they take the place of our spiritual senses for the purpose of protecting our natural interest. I just talked about the five senses protecting our natural physical bodies, right? And when you're not growing in God's word, your five natural senses take over your five spiritual senses. What reason and what purpose? It is to protect the interests of your natural interest. What natural interest are you talking about? I'm talking about those habits that we picked up. So now you want to protect those habits. And even if you listen to those in authority, now your natural Five senses are protecting you from your pastor's message, from your leader's message, from the rabbi's message. And you're being so protected that you would rather stay home and watch it from there rather than be in the presence. Why? Because your five senses are protecting you and protecting the interest of the natural man that is actually fighting and warring against God. This is why it's so difficult for believers to go through a transition. Why they, they don't want to get involved, they don't want to engage. Barely will they come to, to, to Sunday service. You know, almost being dragged to come in there. Taking advantage of pandemic. I, I, I'm still afraid. I'm still afraid. And me and my family, we, 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 we got some sniffling going on right now. You know? Yeah. This is why it's so hard to go through this transition to get to that place where God will really use us. What trade-off is this when God is offering you garlands for ashes? But God says, all you have is nothing. And look what I'm offering you. A garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. And you're living a heavy life. And all you have is the joy of watching TV. Going to the movies, maybe. Going to the ballparks. What kind of trade-off is that? And that's why it's so hard to go through the transition. They are operative on the, on the natural senses that the natural senses when they begin to see that, that, that you, you might just have a desire to let's be in church, we've missed church for a long time and then your five natural senses, they, they sound the alarm and they say, danger, danger, danger. Danger, yeah. It means that we might become obsolete. We might die. Natural life forbids this, please. And we don't know why we, we have issues that we cannot resolve, fights and contentions and unable to, to come up with answers that God already has for us.
So Moses, Jeremiah, Gideon, Joshua, many others in the Word of God, they all also had difficult time with transition. They had difficult times when God gave them a new assignment. And why is that? These are giants, right? These are our heroes. These are the ones we go after to learn from. But it's important for us to know that even them had a hard time going through a transition period of time. I think, again, because a transition disturbs our routine. And even though these were men of God, they also developed their routine. And in that routine, they would rather stay there and not go across into the promised land. Or maybe they don't want to go and take a city right now. Look, right now, we don't want to. We're just having a good luau right now, you know. <laughs> no, we don't want to take that city, you know. It might lose a few people. And these were really men and women of God, and they're having this, this uh, difficult time because they knew that if they accepted the assignment from God, it would mean a transition, and a transition is always painful to the natural. We get used to a routine. Would you just slip up your hand and thank God what he's giving you right now? Amen. Transition disturbs our routine. It shakes up. Shakes us up sometimes even big time. And we immediately, immediately say, Oh, God, going to Torah class, that's, that's never been my plan. And you're asking me to go to Torah class? I, I don't know how I'm going to, to, to fix this and change my schedule to be able to be at church three times a week and go to Torah class to learn the deeper things of God. And then just maybe we will have a word or two to give to Mr. Transition and say to Mr. Transition, how dare you try to, to edge me out of my comfort zone? Because transition comes, right? It says it's time to change. How dare you try to edge me out of my routine? You see, we don't think that way all the time, right? But how many times through our, our believing and walking with God's life have we rejected an assignment and rejected a transition to stay where we are because we're comfortable there and we translated, I haven't heard from God. So I haven't heard from him personally. I know what the pastor said, but you know, I haven't heard from him. I know what the rabbi is saying here tonight, but I need to hear it directly from him. And so I'm going to just talk to this transition a spirit or person and tell them, who do you think you are? To tell me that I need to get out of my comfort zone. Look at what's going on in the world. Look what's going on in Ukraine. Look what's going on in our neighborhoods. Look what's going on across America and our government. And you are talking to transition to get out of there. Get out of your life. My. The truth is a transition will often strip away everything that is non-essential. And move us to question everything we know about ourselves. And we do not want to do that. And our place in the world, and we don't want to go there either, because we love our neighborhood park more than we love the world. We love Costco more than we love the word of the Lord, and we keep going there to get the food that is not from heaven, but the food that is only going to take care of the natural.
But there are times, folks, there are times when we have no choice, no choice but to accept the transition. For example, in this pandemic, the pandemic taught us that regardless of how upset we can be and we get, we have no choice. We have no choice but to go through a transition and shift and put on that mask and shift in our consciousness and awareness that this is necessary. It is demanding, but for many necessary, over 200,000 millions have died in order for us to survive. And as we survived, hopefully there would be a birth, a birthing of a very different way of living. Maybe more. This is a, a what do they call it? This monkey what? If there's monkey pot? No. How many other things are going to come? Tiger pots? OK. Who knows what's in the horizon, but I do know that he said it in Matthew, that before he comes, there's going to be pestilence. And pestilence are diseases that kill. So there could be no stopping. But look, you've already accepted a transition. And the transition is that you may have to continue to live with all of this. The bad news is only for those that refuse to go through a spiritual transition. Because those that go through a, a spiritual transition will become the leaders of those that are not. And will have a word in season and out of season. And we will be able to save multitudes. Amen. I spend uh, over an hour today with Ukraine. And... Uh, what an amazing opportunity that we have right now to, to touch Ukraine for the Lord. They says, could you come as quickly as possible? I said, well, not quickly as possible, but let me, let me check with Hashem because my transition could be at any moment. <laughs> but they wanted me to go right away. And I says, what I'd like to do is maybe start working with your chaplains because they have 52 chaplains that are in the military in the second largest messianic church. Well, it's supposed to be the, the largest messianic church in the world. I will share more of that information later. So I mentioned the truth is that a transition will strip us from everything that's not essential. But it's going to move us to question everything about ourselves and begin to move us in the right direction. This is what the message is today. God desires to move us, to move you in the right direction if you have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. But we need to shift in consciousness and awareness that this is necessary in order to spiritually survive be able to save as many people as possible. So when we become the kind of men and women that is now seasoned, we're talking about, mature, mature enough to allow a shift. Are you mature enough to allow a shift? Are you, are you mature enough to allow a transition? To hear the voice of God for a change. Starting with the, with the way that we relate with others. And the way we treat non-believers. And also, not only that, but the way that we, we treat non-creatures and we treat in our planet. So we're truly going to become serious and seasoned in the Lord, become true students of the Word of God. We need, to, we need the proper foundation. Are we getting some good foundation here? Yes. Proper foundation so that you may teach your children in the way that they should go. 
by becoming familiar with certain biblical terminologies that we're going to get into. Not this night, but we're going to get into those soon. And not just glossing over certain terminologies. Uh, the, these words are, are too difficult to understand. But let me tell you something. There's a lot of words that you don't understand when the doctor makes out a prescription. But it doesn't matter whether you understand them or not. You better go in that direction that the one that is seasoned is telling you that you need this. So next week, I'm going to start going into those um, terms that you need to become familiar with, such as esoteric, and, and so forth and so on. But for now, we won't have time, so I'd like for you to put your name on that little paper that you received. Uh, please put your name there, one corner, and then turn it in, because I, I, I don't want to have to print out next week. Just turn those in tonight. Um, to pastor, to anyone here that's responsible person, and, and then I will, we will hand them out to you next week. Okay, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, turn it in with your name so you can get it back. Is, uh, can someone say amen tonight? Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Let us stand and thank uh, our living God for the word that he has given to us. Truly, you have said that all of heaven, not where you abide, but the heavens right above us will pass away. And this earth is well, but not your word. This is the word that changes, transforms, revolutionizes our complete lifestyle, and makes us mature as Yeshua the Messiah. So that we can be like the, the Kohen, the high priest, and be able to share from a pure heart and bring the body of the Lord into unity, into oneness. I feel your heart, Lord, for your people. Please, Lord, heal so many of the hearts that need to walk in righteousness so that we may have, Lord, an army that is pure in their heart. That we might all together see the bigness of God that you desire and can turn our ashes into a garment of praise and be a people that truly will praise you. For your word says that the day is coming, and it's even now at hand, that you will have a people that will worship you in spirit and in true truth. In Yeshua's name, I pray, amen. Let's go ahead and give Rabbi a nice...